So, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to sit down and have a, a lengthy conversation with Peter Brynjelsson, one of my heroes when it comes to progressive music here in Sweden. A fantastic guitarist and producer, but not only that, also a great author and he's also a professor in, in music theory or film music theory, I think the, the term is. Before we start, I just wanted to let you know that his books are out there for sale. I should pick one or every one up if I were you. Unfortunately, they are only in Swedish, so this is towards the, the Swedish speaking or reading sort of audience of my of my channel. Um, unfortunately, I say that because they are so great. I even ha have a few upstairs. They are so great and everyone, I mean, film, uh, music, the tale of Lord of the Rings, the film, the the uh, movie, and and uh, this is about Ragnarok's uh, record and this is about Peter Green. It's just so fantastic and Peter will talk um, about all this in the conversation that we have. So enjoy and thank you so much, Peter, for doing this. So uh, I'm sitting here with uh, with uh, Peter Brynjelsson, uh, and it, P Peter, could you just uh, start with uh, introducing yourself and uh, letting the, the audience know who you are? Uh, I'm uh, a musician since 50 years. I I, I reckon that I started uh, 72. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of bands and. Um, uh, also as a theater and film musician and also as an academic uh, on high schools and universities and also an author. So I've written nine books, uh, all about music in a way, but I try to uh, expand the, this, um, this subject of music. Yeah, that's a good uh, d d description. I, um, I, I, I've started to. I, I knew. I, I my first contact with you were when I uh, went to to um, the university in Halmstad, and you were uh, having a guest lecture there about movies and uh, I think movies and music, but also movies and sounds. So yeah. my introduction to you were through your books about uh, sounds in music. I think yeah. this is before I knew about uh, that you were a, a, a member of Ragnarök. Mm. Uh, if I knew that, I think I would talk to you more uh, <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um, but I loved your your books and your theories uh, about movies and sounds. Uh, so I've been following your career um, with great interest. And I remember you had a... I think you had a concert with a symphony orchestra and uh, horror music, something with a chainsaw, but I might be mistaken. Yeah, it was actually uh, on a seminar I arranged oh, okay. with the, um, the most famous scholars in film music, ah. uh, both from Japan, United States, United Kingdom, uh, and Sweden. And... Uh, we, we we have a sort of a loose orchestra in Sweden called the Great Learning Orchestra. Okay. And uh, so uh, it's um, free to participate for all us composers and musicians. And um, we started off with like minimalistic music, like by Terry Riley and Steve Reich and so forth, where you could easily follow a so, sort of a sound um a script uh, in a way. And at this seminar, I wanted us to uh, play all the sounds and music from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, that's awesome. So we followed the whole film. So uh, uh, it was a guy with a chainsaw, and I did the, uh, through a Moog uh, synthesizer, I did the in the film, it's um, a generator that generates electric power. Okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, here and there, you can see this generator going to, 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 and I did those sounds. Okay. And, and we have also, we had a, a, a woman screaming choir. 
Okay. That's us cried all the uh, <laughs> like that when they were chased by chainsaws. So we looked upon it as a composition, not as a film. No, okay. That's super interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if if uh, correct me if I'm 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 wrong, but this is probably what you're most famous for uh, uh, internationally. Is that correct, uh, or is it just? Uh, it actually depends because uh, my later group Urban Turban. Uh, if you meet uh, a person that's really into Urban Turban, they often don't recognize Ragnarök. Okay. Um, so, is it the other way around also? Yeah. Uh, and I had a group called Kung Tung as well that was a sort of a hard rock group at the time in Sweden. And I meet people that are really into those songs. Uh, I had a concert last week where I met people that required songs from that album that <laughs> I had to play. Okay. So it, uh, uh, I've done a lot of things and also Triangulus with Björn G. G. Lind is yeah. also sometimes I meet people, I must hear this song and so forth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I listened to an interview uh, just uh, the other day with you where you talked about this record and that this record is one of the, the records that people come up to you and say that they heard and they love and they want you to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about. And you uh, you said in the interview that you don't remember much uh, from, the, uh, from the recording of it. Uh, and I thought that was super interesting. And you talked also about Stay With Heaven with... Um, 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 page and plant yeah uh, and that they also get requests and, and people come up to them uh, it, are, are you tired of talking about this? No uh, but uh, uh, what people don't um, understand uh, I can rem uh, uh, tell you that I met I've met uh, like Mick Taylor and Frank Zappa and uh, Robert Plant and Adrian Ballou, and it's always the same thing. Okay. And uh, people doesn't understand when, when they approach Bob Dylan or uh, Bruce Springsteen, they think that they make them happy by saying, I've listened to your music so much and it has made me very happy. But what you actually say is, I listened to you, the music you made when you were 20 years old. I have yeah. not heard anything you've done after you, you were 35. Uh, so in a way you say, now you actually stink, but when you were 20, you were quite good. And so it's as if you meet a plumber and you say, you were a very good plumber when you were 23. Yeah. But now you're actually quite bad. Uh, so yeah, when I met Mick Taylor, he was a very bitter guy. Okay, okay. He was angry at Bob Dylan, at the Stones, at John Mayle. Everyone had hurt him. And I think he didn't really want to say that. He just wanted to say, I've done better things after that. Okay. But it was so clear during the concert that he hadn't. Okay, okay. It was very, very clear that he hadn't d done better things than L Laurel Canyon by John Mayer. And yeah. then he was 18 years old. Yeah. So uh, for me, Ragnarök, I was 19 years old when we recorded this thing. Yeah. And it's sort of a miracle because we, were, we weren't at all prepared we weren't um we hadn't sent a lot of demos and were convinced that these songs are good and these are not okay uh, we actually took a big chance by just recording these things and when we departed after this lp album we were not at all still convinced that this was a re good record mm -hmm. and that came even bigger when we talked to the record company after this. They said, oh, we just wonder why you didn't really 
got the swing, and so they were quite critical. Oh shit! So uh, when we actually, um, I think it was the fans that convinced us. Okay. That we had made a good record. And that took 30 years or something for us to believe in that. And it's exactly the same thing with good films. Uh, for, I, I can mention about the music. You can be very, very surprised when you read the critics of Led Zeppelin up to the fourth, fifth or sixth album. They were not at all praised. No, no, yeah, I know. So they thought, why, are ev why is everyone against us? Now it's cult and it's a, a praise, but they didn't feel that at the time. And it's exactly the same with Deep Purple and a lot of groups. So this thing with being... Uh, have um, sharing a sort of a miracle. The yeah. miracle is partly, and in our case, it's so good because on YouTube, the people choose the songs they like the most. Okay. And then uh, we actually are very happy because they are uh, the songs that we also like the most. Okay. Yeah. So Dogana Scum, for example, is. Uh, seen by 120,000 people oh, that actually love it. And we can say, we agree with you. <laughs> and, the, and the worst songs of Ragnarök, they are not even on YouTube because ah. so few people have loved them. Okay. And that's from the fourth album that was lousy overall. But uh, so um, in a way, people are... Uh, a part of creating this miracle. Uh, sure, I haven't thought about that. It's it's the same way for, uh, with, uh, I guess, uh, the other way around with Neil Young, who who uh, uh, always plays like uh, Rockin' in the Free World and A Heart of Gold, which is his two worst songs, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. He's done so much better uh, music, and it's always those two that pops up mm. when you talk about people uh, with people. But if we go back... Yeah, but, yeah, so, so, so that's a lucky thing for us because I saw Cornelius is a very famous uh, Swedish troubadour and I saw him three times live and the people were shouting uh, those most popular songs all right through and he said he tried to convince the people they are not good I don't want to sing them but they refused they had to hear them yeah. and uh, it was a pain for him, but we can play these songs with great heart and think, yeah, yeah this is good music. So uh, that's 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 awesome. Uh, uh, if we go back a little bit to you, where did you come from? A musical family? Uh, no, no, not at all. But uh, I have written a lot about this in my books. That during the sixties, when I grew up. Um, that was a sort of a um, united longing for culture in the whole social democratic movement. So we were all forced to go to music school to play a uh, block flute, a uh, little wooden flute, and uh, later on piano or guitar. So in a way it was, uh, but as all of us, we saw Beatles on television and was like um, addicted to this dream of of what uh, yeah what rock music could prove to be or something yeah okay what was your influences because uh, i mean if you recorded the first record and a lot of records you have recorded on silence and silence yeah. is a uh uh masterful label here in, in Sweden, but you recorded it in 1976. There were a lot of records that today is cult records and awesome records um, that were recorded before that. Were, were you aware of those records? Were you influenced yeah, 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 by those sure. records? It was like uh, first um, it's sort of a development from Beatles over to Cream um, and then uh, Mountain, Pink Floyd, 
uh, all those groups. But 70, 1970, I heard November, the first Swedish, it was like an answer to cream. It was like a Swedish cream. And uh, then I heard, I was the arranger of music festivals. So I heard in a row, Kebne Kajse, Trägget så stenar, Fläsket brinner, Samla mammas manna. And that uh, like dipped me into a swimming pool of influences. And those combined also, like Trägget så stenar, were much into Terry Riley. Kebne yep. uh, Kajse were sort of a mix between um, ventures, cream and Swedish folk music. And uh, Flesket Brinner were like a Swedish Santana, if you uh, wish. Yeah. And Samla Mamas Manna were totally unlike anything you could hear. It was like a mix between Nino Rota and uh, uh, crazy circus music. Yeah. Um, it was like circus music on speed or something. Yeah. It was. A bit sappa uh, there was also. Uh, so it was a, an, an education. And later on, when I disbanded Ragnarök 84, um, I played then with Uwe Karlsson from Arbit of Fritid. I played with Kenny Håkansson, which I still do. I played with Bill Örström from Fleske Brin. I played with a lot of these guys, my idols in a way. Yeah, okay. So I was like educated by these guys in a very rough manner, you could say, because they were not at all every time um, kind okay. to a guy from, from Kalmar. Or I mis misunderstand them or mi mi misunderstood them. Sometimes like Kenny from Kebne Kaisi, he was just a shy a shy man, but since he looked so gorgeous with his long hair and Mexican mustache and this painted guitar, I thought he was dangerous or okay. or high on heroin or something. But he wasn't. No. He was just a shy guy. So, uh, uh, but I could say I, I was educated by these these musicians. But the, it's a it's a pretty uh, long leap uh, from cream to Kebne Kaiser. Uh, I've always stated that the Swedish progressive sort of movement from late sixties to maybe late seventies has its own distinct sound. But I'm I I don't have anything anything to back that up. I just think that we have our folk music and we have the blend of rock and maybe something in, I don't know, our education uh, or the uh, availability of music uh, schools. I, in my latest book, uh, uh, which is called Sagan om Sagan om Ringen, yeah. um, I, I, uh, I state a lot of quite dairy uh, theories one of them, uh, one of them uh, is that, like, like Björn Borg is the start of the Swedish tennis movement. Without Björn Borg, there wouldn't have been a Mats Wilander or a Stefan Edberg. Uh, when a, a guy is so in the focus, there sits a lot of other people watching him and think, I could be that also. Yeah. So when Bo Hansson became world famous, uh, first with Hansen and Carlson, and then with the marvelous record Sagan am Ringen. Uh, it made so many people think that this, this means something. You yeah. can do a sort of a Swedish instrumental psychedelic music, because I don't call it prog anymore. Because it just make you confused. Because in the in England they, they think prog is a P R O G with one G, yeah. and it's like Jethro Tull and. Uh, but in Sweden, where you say prog, most of the people mean prog with two Gs, yeah. and they mean very political songs 
nearly near to Bertolt Brecht uh, in a rock version or something. And we were not at all that. And uh, when you, when you um, circle into these groups, they aren't more than like um, 10 groups, but it's totally unique that in Sweden, uh, there were so many groups that played only instrumental music. You can't find that in England because all these groups we were inspired of, like King Crimson, and they were song oriented. It yeah. was songs, and then they expanded the instrumental parts. But in Sweden, it was only in, in, in instrumental music. And that was totally unique. You can't find that in France. You can't find that in Germany. All this group, crowd rock, was also song oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Even Magma and Per Ubu, they are also song oriented. Yeah. In Sweden, yeah. Fleskel Plinner, Samla Mammas Manna, Kebne Kajse, Ragnarök, all these playing only instrumental music. And um, that is for the first, very unique. Then a lot of these group, groups had a drummer that was from the bebop jazz. Yeah. So it, it made the rhythms quite flowy and like uh, um, jazzy in a way. So that was also a unique element. And then uh, they didn't take so many drugs that the English and American musicians did. Okay. Uh, in America, they took heroin, LSD, amphetamine, cocaine, everything. And in uh, England as well. But in... I should... Are you are you still there? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so so it's like quite unique that yeah. uh, because I asked them how many drugs did did you take, and the Swedish bebop jazz musicians they were a lot into heavy drugs. Yeah, yeah. But not the psychedelic movement. They they tried LSD around the uh, theater musical appearance of the musical hair, but then they I we leave this. Apart from Boo Hansen, that was heavily into drugs. Okay. But all these others, they mainly stuck to what we call brass or shit. Uh, so it was like influenced of drugs, but not that heavy that Cream was or, or, or Pink Floyd or so. And uh, then there was the element of Swedish folk music. And uh, I think it started with Merit Hemmingsson, with um, uh, her playing hammer organ yeah. uh, polskas. And, and, uh, and then um, uh, Kebne Kajse took this up. But you could trace this in nearly every of these groups, even the political groups had this da, 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 da. Yeah. It was everywhere during this time. And it was a sort of trying to, for us, for example, we were um, bo born into the blues rock stuff. Yep. And to get out of there, we had to find another element. And that was the Swedish folk music. Yep. Because it, it used nearly the same uh, music scales, but a little bit apart, because then you had the major seven yep. in those minor scales. Okay. So it was a way of finding your own Swedish blend in this. Is do you, do you think that it, it's the the folk element or the rock element that uh, you? Because when I listen to this instrumental prog music, I, I uh, relate it to uh, sort of dark woods uh, angst, um, the Swedish sort of um, melancholy. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I've written about that also uh, because. Uh, uh, I'm pretty convinced that uh, the Swedish woods and the sort of typical Swedish nature um, influence quite uh, clear how the music sounds. Yeah. So you could trace that in in countries where you have a very open country and a flat. It's going to sound a bit in that way. Yeah, uh, I think it, it 
it nearly sounds as if I am on the same side as uh, naturalist fascistic uh, groups, but uh, <laughs> I don't claim at all that there is a sort of Swedish nationality in mu music, but just a northern light yeah. of what you could say because of, and you could trace that in our language also. Okay. There, there, there you have it very, very clearly. And uh, then uh, it sounds a bit different if, if you come from the southern, as I do, uh, apart from the northern countries, uh, as a lot of other do. But I, I mean, we are so heavily influenced by English music and culture. So I have, a, I have some friends that are from England in my village, and they are so surprised of how much we Swedes know about England. They oh, yeah. don't know so much. No, no. I went backpacking yeah. in, in uh, entire England and Scotland, and uh, one of the other uh, travelers asked me how uh, north of Sweden was, and I said I'd never gone to north of Sweden, and they asked why are you going to uh, backpacking in uh, England when you haven't been to Sweden, and then that's yeah. partly true. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We seek we seek something that we don't have, I guess, uh, and we're pretty good at it. Mm. Um, I, I've read uh, almost the entire, I should say, uh, uh, your your latest book, uh, the mm. Tale of Lord of the Rings. If that's the yeah. right pronunciation, yeah. it's uh, yeah. it's in Swedish. I guess that it's not out in in English. No, so there is an agent that wants to uh, publish it in, uh, but it's about so many things. So I am. Um, some of them is very oriented to Sweden, or, and some some yeah, sure. are not. Um, but uh, but yeah yeah, yeah I, I, in my in my opinion, it would be uh, a, a no brainer to to do it in in English because you on one hand you have the entire sort of music uh, fan scale, but your theories on uh, the books are mesmerizing like I, there, you, you state things that i've never thought about and i've seen mm -hmm. the films and read the books so um but how how did you sort of how did you decide to do um a book about the movies the books and uh, the record lord of the rings by bo hansen i don't know how much you know about my authorship but i started with writing a book about film music and that was not so hard because I already teach and everything about that. And then I continue with, with a book about uh, silence that uh, I think yeah. is not existing. And I noticed then how many people were angry at me because <laughs> I stated things that they don't agree with. Okay. Um, so my whole authorship was trying to find subjects that no one else wrote about. Yeah. And uh, so after that, I wrote a book about music and torture. And that also made a lot of people angry because they thought music are the best thing in the world. It, you can't have war if you have music. And I say, no, it's exactly the opposite. Okay. No wars have been committed without music. Ah. And I haven't re read that. I have to read that. Again, people were very angry at me. Yeah. Uh, of course, I get a bit upset and sad about that they are so angry at me. But uh, that inspired me all the more to find other subjects. So I wrote a book about the unmusical, the people yeah. who don't understand music. Also, again, people were angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I, there was a subject that I have wondered about so much, and it's the Tolkien's books yeah. and how they were interpreted as films. Yeah. And uh, since I knew so much about Bo Hansen and, and the Swedish psychedelia, I started to write about that. I thought the book was going to be about that. Okay. How the 
Tolkien's books has had inspired the whole alternative movement in both Sweden, America, and United States, yeah. or in England. And then it, it transformed into writing about every aspect of what Tolkien's books had inspired to. The metal scene, yeah. the religious sects, and then very heavily um, the fascist movement of today, how yeah. much they have been inspired. And this time, the angry people have been much more angry and much more, um, they actually refuse to see that um, link. Okay. Because okay. they love Tolkien's books and yeah. the films. So how could it be linked to something that is evil? They refused. Hmm. And uh, uh, now I'm going to a big tour yeah. where I'm going to lecture on the book. I'm sure I'm going to meet these. Um, yeah, sure. Those people are nerds. Yeah. Tolkien Obviously. nerds. And they have just decided, I love these books and the films, so they can't be bad. It's, it's the same with Wagner, which I mentioned in the book. There was a TV series from England where Stephen Fry, the famous, um, famous comedian, he loves Wagner and he stands in front of the statue of Wagner and asks the statue, I can't understand it. You write so beautiful music and still you are an anti-Semite. Yeah. How can you do it to me? No, no, yeah. yeah. And I say it's totally natural. Yeah. <laughs> you can you can, and that's also a thing with meeting your famous mu musical idol. And suddenly they are unfriendly, <laughs> they are bitter, <laughs> they are exactly everything in the opposite of what you thought they would be. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, so if they have uh, written so much beautiful music, it's not at all sure that what they are as persons no. are the same as their music. They can be lousy uh, scoundrels and still write beautiful music. Yeah, sure. That's the, the very, and you can meet also people that write lousy books and films and be very friendly. Yeah. They are uh, oh, beautiful people. So it's not uh, linked. No, uh, no, obviously not. Um, I remember well, when. I, I hear that the guys are a bit, uh, they want to start playing soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you phone me uh, tomorrow evening yeah. um, uh, at the same time, I'm sure we are going to continue because it's fun to talk about. Yeah, it's I'm not sure. Interesting. Uh, so I try to go and uh, uh, play. Um, I now play organ. Oh, okay. Time. Only organ. Like Hanson. Yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> More like Booker T in the end, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, bye see, bye. Tomorrow. So we, we talked a little bit uh, yesterday about your um, academic sort of uh, career and, and uh, you're being uh, a scholar in uh, music theory or film music theory. It Is was uh, closely linked to film music. Film music. Because I was... Uh, uh, Practically the only one who who wrote about and and lectured about that uh, at that time. Okay. During the nineties and the beginning of the twenties, um, uh, and I I communicated with a lot of these uh, scholars in England and and America and so forth. Okay. Have you continued with that, or is that behind you? Yeah. Uh, Funnily enough. Uh, it has started again because I'm going on a lecture tour to northern part of the countries, and there is also universities I'm going to lecture at. Okay, cool. Uh, I, I remember when you talked about uh, Michel Chion's uh, yeah. vision, and um, I don't know if you can can uh, just tell me uh, quickly a little bit of, of uh, Michel Chion's theories, and also if uh, it's something that you have. Uh, 
been able to work with uh, at, uh, when you created music? Um, Actually, it's very hard to um, uh, practice your theories in film music when you do film music. You're often stuck in composing film or theater music with just the practical stuff, get the music working. Yeah, or yeah. or um, get the hell out of here. <laughs> so okay, okay, okay. it's uh, yeah, uh, uh, the thing with academic theories uh, f- uh, from a film perspective. It started when you could record um, film on video, and then um, everyone had a video um facility to uh, to play it over and over again so you could see scenes in pulp fiction 200 times or 300 times and then you saw other things than you did in the 40s when nearly everyone saw film once yeah and never again so um it, it um the whole theory business was in the old times a lot about books that you could read a lot of times, okay. but film uh, wasn't that. And um, uh, the musical side of things, I think the whole thing with Chion and my theories was that it was very easy to say that music was in the background, mm. but if, uh, he taught that even music was not a part of the film even yeah yeah it was just in your mind so to say it was more a part of yourself when you were looking at the film or watching film than it was a part of the film it seems strange when i say it but when you uh, uh, when you meet a person that is very very sure that there was no music in the film. Yeah. And you say there was a lot of music, yeah. but you didn't hear it. That's another thing, because you thought that the music was inside you or something, that it was a part of you. And that is so interesting. Um, uh, and that pointed out for me that a lot of sounds actually is perceived as a part of yourself and not something that comes from the outside and coming in. And um, yeah, then it took me to a totally uh, different and strange landscapes, according to sound. Okay. Yeah, I remember uh, listening to an interview with you and you talked about Dracula and uh, um, when Dracula comes home and he he uh, goes down to his uh, sort of uh, I don't know what it's called in English uh, not grave uh, the cellar uh, yeah the cellar yeah and you have strings and stuff yeah. like that um, and I can't remember what you said you said that uh, I mean obviously there's not a the, Lo- the London Symphony Orchestra isn't there in the room so <laughs> obviously no, so people ought to ask themselves where the hell is the music coming from yeah uh, and but they don't do that because you're so used to this so you start to perceive it as a part of yourself and and in horror movies it's very interesting because it's only about if you are scared or if you, or if you are not. So the, the easiest way to show this is when you look at films about snakes. Okay. But uh, so it's documentaries about cobras, for example, and you see these films and there is always a very calm, cool voice that say, uh, cobras is not dangerous. They are very beautiful animals. But every time there is a close-up on the snake and it um, goes after the camera or something, then you have music under that that say "woom," <laughs> and yeah. and uh, so the whole music thing is contradicting what they are saying. Yeah. But uh, they count on that the people will not. They are so 
focused on the snake and what it's doing. So they will never see that uh, because if you don't have music, you actually see that the snake is not moving that fast. <laughs> it's not that dangerous. You have to um, stamp on the snake to get bitten. Yeah. So if the snake has any chance, it goes away and flee because it's much more afraid of you than it, we are for, for them. Yeah. So you have to strengthen this danger stuff with music. But the people will not see that they think the, day, the snake is very, very dangerous, yeah. even if we say so, but they never see that it's the music that do these things. And you, wrote, uh, you, you wrote the book about, uh, I don't know the Swedish translation of it, but is, is it music and war or music and war? Yeah, uh, it, the, the, um, actually the title is uh, 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 music that is blood serious. Yeah, and uh, that is a joke because you often say uh, about the music that you 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 um, like very much. This is music for sure. That is blood serious. But in this meaning, it really means blood serious because yeah. it's about music that is used during the Second World War or the Vietnam War or the old wars in the 17th century and so forth. Yeah. And how it was done. And, and um, the strange thing that all armies during that time, during the old times, of 10,000 warriors, there were about 400 musicians. Yeah, 400 musicians. That, yeah. yeah. So that's quite strange that they are marching in, in in this uh, whole thing, uh, and uh, uh, drums, play, but... plays music all the time. That is quite merry. Also, it um, wants to tell um, that uh, war is actually quite fun, and uh, we are not afraid. That uh, we think it's lovely to go in this army and uh, so forth. So. I remember because I've, I've thought about this now uh, uh, these days. I haven't read the book, but um, when I heard you talk about it in an interview, uh, I started to think about it. And there's a scene, I think, in uh, Barry Lyndon mm -hmm. where this is is um, pretty sort of uh, you focus on the the sort of the band out in the in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never really thought about that when I. Um, think of of um, uh, music in warfare. I uh, automatically think about uh, Guantanamo, uh, yeah. and that they used popular West Western popular music as a way of torture. Uh, yeah. So it's it's in in one way it's strange that no one has written a book about it uh, before. Yeah, but uh, uh, I did a lot of interviews with uh, tortured people. And also, uh, actually, people that was on the other side, that hmm. was the perpetrators, that had made uh, use of music in a way of helping to kill others. It's insane. And that was uh, uh, very... Um, I learned a lot from this. Uh, Amen. Because... Uh, you, what you learn is that no music has a moral value. Okay. So even Beatles has been used. Uh, it was uh, Yellow Submarine, but anyway. It should be a Ringo tune if it's any, any sort of <laughs> tort. Uh, anyway, uh, you could use anything. And uh, um, so music doesn't have a moral value in itself. No. But um, uh, it can inflect a whole society um, with thoughts and, and things that is um, bound to this music, like Wagner or... Yeah. or uh, um, it has, it's so strange that in the rock culture, 
we accept that a whole part of the rock culture claims to be Satanists, yeah. to be believe in Satan. And uh, when you say, okay, I can accept that, but then you have to take that seriously. Do they believe in Satan? Mm. Some of them really say, yes. We, and, and if you say, no, you're just joking, it's just gimmick, mm. they get very offended. Yeah. So it, it, it's not a part of a gimmick. They, they claim to really believe in Satan. Then you cannot say that that hasn't inflected our society, that we have a whole part of the music culture that claims to believe in the evil side. Yeah. You have to take that seriously. What does it mean? How has it inflicted uh, on our society and all sorts of things like that? Yes. But a lot of people say, no, you're wrong. Uh, yeah. Music can't have that responsibility. Like now, get gangster rap. Of course, you have to take that seriously. They actually, in the videos and everything, they claim to be gangster rappers. And a part of that is the power to kill someone. Yeah. And a lot of these rappers have been shot down yeah. as easily as if you've been in a, a gang criminal. And often they are both. So then you can't claim that this has no value or no, no significance. It's <clears throat> totally impossible. I take music seriously. So I, I try to put the music that uh, people like or that, that they produce and think about uh, in which society did it come from? Uh, how did it, uh, how was it produced? What is the listeners doing and what, what do they um, think of the music? And that has to be taken seriously. That can't be um, claimed to know it's just music. It's, a, it's just a music taste. No, it's not. No. Then actually what you're saying that music is banal. Yeah. Music is not meaning anything except for it's, fun. Yeah, exactly. That's it's just a tool of in Totally in impossible for me. But so much people claim this. And and it's for me crazy stuff. Yeah. I, I remember I, I have a fascination of of uh, uh, Norwegian black metal. I don't mm -hmm. listen to it. I don't mm -hmm. really think that it's good music, but I'm super fascinated of it because of the sort of the cult following and that, as you say, uh, some of them uh, really claim to be uh, worshiping the devil and stuff like that. Yeah. And as older as I get, I mean, we here in Sweden, we don't, uh, most of us at least, don't uh, attend church that often. But when I do, and uh, they sing psalms nowadays, uh, mm. I feel like it's the it's almost like this the same thing. I feel a fascination uh, uh, towards singing uh, the words of God or about God um, no. in, in the same way that I feel of them singing about the devil because they are, in my opinion, because I'm not a believer, in my opinion, uh, they are the same. Um, just yeah, uh, they, want, uh, they, they, they want music to express spirituality. In a way, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, but the Satanist wants it to be. But now it's strange because some of them claim that Satan is not evil; it's God that is evil. Yeah. So it's like, uh, but the Norwegian metal, uh, according to Burson, they uh, he wanted to be evil to burn down churches and everything. So everything about this. I think uh, I I remember I was at a lecture at the music seminar and a guy uh, uh, lectured about Brahms. Okay. And he uh, um, he told us about that Brahms was uh, his parents died when he was very young, so he was brought up at brothels, oh, whorehouses. Wow. Okay. And uh, so the horse became his mothers in a way. And some people in the audience got so upset 
So they st stood up and yelled, what has this got to do with Brahms? Beautiful music. Yeah. And I claim everything. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's yeah. so interesting. Or that Handel was a pedophile. That yeah. is also very yeah. interesting. And it means a lot yeah. to take away all this and say, no, we shall not, we shall pretend that it, it that Kurt Cobain's heroin addiction was not a part of the music. That's impossible for me. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, and uh, I have in my books, I um, uh, written a lot about how much the drugs inflected directly on the music, like Lennon's I'm Only Sleeping. Mm -hmm. That's uh, directly taken from his heroin addiction. So you can't take that away. No. It's uh, totally impossible. Uh, and with Peter Green, as I've written a whole book about, yeah. um, it's about that the LSD and mescaline was very much a part of his uh, creativity. Yeah, and what a creativity it was. Uh, I, I also yeah. I, I listened to when you talked about uh, your book on, on Peter Green and, and your fascination. You have been out uh, playing music of Peter Green and, and talked about him. Yeah. Uh, what what is it with Peter, Peter Green that uh, drawed you in, uh, so to speak? First, it's the music uh, that um, he he comes from a blues band. He starts a blues band, and uh, he, he a lot of people were against him in the beginning because he he uh, came after Clapton in Males Blues Breakers, yeah. and he was a Jewish guy. Uh, okay. Not wealthy Jewish, but poor Jewish family in London. So they yelled at him, uh, get off stage, big nose and um, anti-Semite uh, stuff. Yeah. But he conquered all that and became, uh, no one wanted Clapton after, after one year or something. They wanted Peter Green. Yeah. And then he formed his own band. And as soon as they became very famous, because they were a very good blues band, he drifted off from that. And he made four singles. E each of them is totally fascinating, amazing stuff. And it's a bit bluesy, but it, Albatross is like Shadows, Pink Floyd, uh, it's before Pink Floyd, but in, uh, it's like uh, 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 some Pink Floydish, uh, uh, very uh, spacey stuff, but totally beautiful. And then comes um, Need Your Love So Bad, that is a beautiful blues. And then uh, he goes into uh, Man of the World, that is, yeah. there he is. Uh, the the first song I've heard where a person actually directly tells you, I need help. I'm <laughs> going to kill myself. I, I can't do this anymore. And, uh, uh, but in a beautiful way. <laughs> and, and then comes Oh Well, where he, he, he um, has listened to Villa Lobos, guitar, classical stuff. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and then in the end, Green Malalishi, that is the, uh, where he explains how the demons has come into his head. It's totally amazing, all these things. And the band was not even a part of this. They were just standing aside and wondered, what is this guy doing? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so they, 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 uh, did the band thrived after he left the band, or, or am I... Wrong. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, they they uh, wanted to be just a blues band, so they they thought, why did why does he doing this strange stuff? Why can't we play blues? The, it, we're, we were a good blues band, <laughs> and uh, so what I'm fascinating of is that I have had friends that were fragile in the same way that Peter Green, and I think with those persons, uh, if they wouldn't have taken LSD, they wouldn't have been happy anyway. 
they oh. then they would have taken some other things or um, sleeping pills or anything. They would have uh, broke down anyway. So you can't say that if um, Peter Green had, would have not taken LSD, he would have been a happy guy. No. That wasn't the case. It's it would have come after him anyway. Yeah. That is my op opinion. Yeah. And yeah. the strange things, thing also is that it was not the LSD that destroyed his cap capacity to play. It was the medical treatment. Ah, okay, against uh, the, his, uh, his yeah. addiction. Because was it the same it, with uh, it, Sid Barrett? It, it, it makes the fingers numb. Ah, okay. The medication, so okay. you can't play. Ha. Huh. So that's... Well, well, I, I, I thought about uh, Sid Barrett and, and uh, the, the sort of the waste of talent there. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the same there that you can't really uh, just um, blame the LSD? Uh, would he be... I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but uh, actually the, the same, I think. Um, but they have... Uh, they have different situations, I think. Yeah, yeah ob obviously. Uh, but in Peter Green's case, it was also a lot about insecurity to women. Okay. He, he longed for being together with someone, but he couldn't cope with that. But in, in Sid Barrett's case, that was not a part of the problem even. Uh, he lived together with his mother. He was a beautiful guy. Everyone wanted him or some, but um, he couldn't cope with that. So, oh. But it feels like the music, when, when those two left, that the bands uh, that remained um, took a totally different sort of uh, way. Pink Floyd in... Uh, yeah, doing this more spacey than than maybe only psychedelic and and also uh, I mean uh, Fleetwood Mac obviously with the more pop oriented um, song. Yeah, uh, but I think that the uh, for for Pink Floyd uh, the the success was partly uh, a case of where Roger Waters tried to beat Sid Barrett in songwriting and his, his songs were about Sid Barrett's bre breakdown also. So it's like he uh, used Sid Barrett's breakdown to tell a story yeah. about himself. And the in interesting stuff there is that it's David Gilmour who actually creates the sound of Pink Floyd and he was a friend of Sid Barrett before uh, he joined Pink Floyd. So they were very close. And in Fleetwood Mac's case, there was, I think from Peter Green left the, the 1970, it was actually 10 or 12 years before they became this pop band we know. Oh, okay. So they, they, they uh, uh, continued with not so much success with different lineups. And they were doomed to be this band that was famous for, P for Peter Green mm -hmm. up to they uh, enlisted Lindsay Buckingham and, and, and Stevie Nicks. Then they parted in a totally un another direction. Yeah. But before that, they were like, like uh, trying to be that band that P Peter Green created still, but they couldn't. <laughs> uh, so they were forced to play Albatross and all these songs on each live performance. Yeah. Ah. Um, yeah, I have some records that um, mm -hmm. I want to, to show and maybe talk a little bit about uh, because yeah. I don't have anything with Kung Tung, uh, the band that you were uh, in no. at the same time as Ragnarök, wasn't it? But I have. Uh, no, it was a bit after, uh, but, but any, nearly at the same time. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Yeah, but I have Tianglus. I, I love this record. It's a fantastic yeah. record. And I love uh, Björn Jason Lind's playing on it also. Yeah. And parts of it, if I understood correctly, is is uh, members from Ragnar Rök also. How, yeah. how did this sort of uh, come uh, together, so to speak? It yeah. was actually in the end, uh, before I left Ragnar Rök, um, we were touring in Germany a lot at the time. And... Uh, I t- uh, the fourth album of Ragnarok is a disaster. It really is bad. Okay. Um, and I was very unhappy with that. And I understood that this was a dead end. Um, so uh, on the last German tour, I introduced that song Series B and we played that. Uh, and so the collaboration with Björn Jason Lind was meant to be Ragnarok together with Björn Jason Lind. Okay. But okay. Uh, the others were not that keen on this. Uh, it was just me uh, meeting Björn Jason Lind and um, so forth. So uh, they were like standing aside and uh, just wondered what I, what, what I was going to do. And... Um, so in the middle of the recording of that album, I asked myself, why am I still in this group? And I asked the um, uh, studio engineer, uh, Anders Lind, that has made all these fantastic records, what shall I do? Uh, I want to create a new band. So I, I, uh, I had done a little tour with Uwe Karlsson and... Um, and uh, uh, Don Jonsson in, in Ragnarok and uh, Raimund Juntenen just testing out stuff. And we thought it was great fun. So I decided to do the record with them and uh, also add Hasse Brunesson from Samla Mamas Manna on drums. And then I asked Anders, what shall I do? And uh, because they uh, in Ragnarok didn't want to lose the name because that meant some yeah. credibility and so forth. So he said, just leave the, the name, just leave it to them. It doesn't mean anything. So uh, I just left the band and they could take the name. And uh, then it was meant to be a record called Triangulus, but then the band called was called Triangulus. Okay. And uh, also, um, there was an American guy called Robert Silverstein who had created a, his own record company, Breakthrough Records, in yeah. the United States. And uh, uh, he wanted to release this in, in the United States. So uh, I was uh, visiting America during the summer before the LP came out, or okay. the CD, uh, and um, talked to him. So we prepared everything for this record to come out in in America. So it was uh, uh, quite good for me. And and um, uh, it was so fresh also that Don Jonsson introduced uh, a bit of modern stuff like uh, repeat, repetitive, uh, like the breath in uh, ex- Exquisite. Uh, 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 yeah. That was t- quite new, and Hasse Brunison's D drums was also totally new. And so it was a lot of fun. And uh, Uwe's heavy cello. Yeah, uh, we enjoyed this time a lot. Yeah. And um, uh, But at the same time, all time, I also recorded actually a cassette uh, that was called Winterjacka or Winter yeah, Park, yeah. with only piano music. So it was a very creative time, and I met my future wife at the time. So it was um, so much things happening. Yeah. So I really didn't need Ragnarök. That was, uh, uh, yeah. I, uh, when when comparing uh, the sort of the mid seventies to the mid eighties, in this case, uh, obviously a lot of things on the musical sort of. Um, scope has happened but 
I thought of this today. Like if we talk about uh, Ragnar Röks and or um, uh, Fleskit Brinner or uh, Quartet som Sprängde, those kind of records, to me, they sound like the Swedish woods. Is this uh, and the, the music from the 80s when, when sort of prog bands or uh, psychedelic Swedish bands went into the 80s, was it a sort of um, industrial music revolution? Taking music. yes, uh, uh, actually, uh, that record Triangulus was the first uh, that we released on CD, for for okay. example, yep. and yep. Uh, we uh, uh, used some um, uh, synthesized sounds and uh, this with D drums that was totally new for us yep. and and. Uh, but we have all had also listened to other bands at the time, like Talking Heads and, yes. and Peter Gabriel, and and um, so it was a lot of things happening. But I I didn't enjoy the eighties. I I thought okay. it was a horrible decade uh, with musical um, decade. Yeah, the entire sort of musical decade. Yeah. Uh, not uh, not all the uh, the 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 politics and and the music like Frankie goes to Hollywood and yep. sort of that stuff. I hated that. Yep. Uh, I, and, I, I, um, I ask because I agree. I've always yeah, uh, t- and you could hear it. I have claimed that you could hear it on, for example, David Bowie's records. Yes, where you can hear in the beginning he had these wonderful rhythms in changes, and then in the eighties he went doom. Do, 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 yep. do. Yes. like this straightforward one, two, three, four. Yep. And I hated it. It was yep. like, uh, so we had a struggle finding our path uh, in this in this time. Um, it was not easy. So we found like Magma from France and yep. we found... Uh, uh, we toured a lot in, in Germany, so then we found all this crowd rock stuff also. So it was like we, we were searching. So then uh, when we made the second Triangulus, I had much wider ambitions with creating a, a big orchestra with horns and with s- string ensemble and with two drummers and with everything yeah. uh, so we, we were 12 in the band live yeah, and awesome. uh, uh, then it was uh, even more uh, musicians from the uh, the person that I idolized like Mira Gatsch on drums and Shelley Westling on on saxophone Roland Chaser on saxophone and uh, it was amazing for me to play with these but I, I can see that uh, the, the album maybe became a bit um, not so unified, but okay. it, it, it was needed for me to have this great ambition. I started to write um, partiture and, and uh, arrange for these big ensembles. And uh, when I moved to Umeå, uh, I, I released my first solo album there, Via, and then again I had this, uh, then I collaborated with the Umeå Symphony Orchestra. Okay. And uh, uh, so I wrote uh, big uh, sheet music for this, wow. and, and uh, yeah, it was a very creative time for me because I, I expanded my whole musical thinking. Uh, then then uh, actually, uh, that album it was another uh, revolution going on technically because uh, then I was introduced to recording with click track. Ah. That, that means tick 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 tick, and you record one music at the at the time, not the whole band, and then you can replace everything and. Um, we had sampled horns and things. I did that for the first time there. Um, and on the second solo album, uh, Lyckliga Stjärna, then I was even more ambitious. So it's, uh, I think it's 74 minutes of music. And uh, 
the ensemble is 19 persons. Oh, shit. Uh, with uh, singers and strings and oboe, fagot and everything. Um, and now I think it's, you can really hear that. Uh, I don't know if you have heard this album. No, no, I haven't heard that. It's on uh, YouTube anyhow, so you can listen to it there. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was so much ambition into it and so much music, 74 minutes and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and did, did I listened to a lot of... On... What? Sorry, sorry. Uh, I listened to Alan Peterson and uh, um, Arvo Pat and uh, totally okay. another... Uh, range of music and I went to composition schools and everything like that but when you do like complicated music that is uh, I, I, I had listened a lot to uh, uh, Jill Evans records with Miles Davis and I tried to beat him because he used four harmonies in one octave and I used five harmonies okay. in one octave <laughs> So I really tried to break my bones and, and uh, uh, but out from that, in the end of that, we just joked around with doing set the controls for the heart of the sun with this big uh, ensemble. And that was like uh, we were, I was shown that you could do very happy, swingy music with great ambitions. So there, Urban Turban started. Okay, so it was then so that Urban Turban started. It was, uh, I had a commission to make music for the world exhibition in Sevilla in Spain <laughs> on hurdy-gurdy and a lot of other instruments. <laughs> so in the end, I tried hurdy-gurdy on rolling and tumbling, the old blues. And I noticed this is actually something that no one had done. So we did, did Roland Tumblin and then we did Hoochie Coochie Man. And then I started to search for instruments that was like hurdy gurdy, like bagpipes or turkey jimbus or all these old instruments and did blues music on those. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so the whole Urban Turban setup was doing ordinary songs like Folsom Prison Blues and That's All Right Mama with music that was not at all fitted to do this. <laughs> and uh, it was just a game and we had so much fun with it, just coming up with, yes, let's play drums on a lamp uh, <laughs> uh, and so forth. And... Uh, it was a big success, and, and going from that very ambitious second solo album, which was considered as, wow, this is uh, heavy music, but to this very happy where, where people just was amazed. This was hilarious, yeah. people said. And uh, so it was a great success with Urban Turban, and that made me going on a voyage from 93 to, and it's still in a way going on, that we made uh, three albums with the first like set up. And then we made a fourth album um, uh, just uh, some years ago uh, where we translated Swedish lager to Persian language. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's called Paradis. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and um, then I made a lot of collaborations with Syrian musicians, Kurdish musicians, Turkish, Egyptian, Morocco, Palestine. Uh, so that made also that I uh, was forced to uh, come into new rhythms, new scales, new, new everything. Um, so in the early ambition there, I tried to go into the classical stuff, but now I was on a voyage into Arabian mu music yeah. and so forth. So, um, it reminds me was, of it, uh, quite funny when I met Robert Plant, I actually thought that we had something to speak about because he had done the same voyage, yeah. 
but it never came up as a thing that yeah. ah, okay mm. I, I I thought of like in the in the I guess late 60s uh, up to mid 70s there were a lot of collaborations in jazz with um Polish and um let's see okay to miss Turkish uh, musicians and it feels like um uh, with the sort of blend of Swedish jazz American jazz uh, folk music and these Turkish and and Polish uh, musicians coming with their mm. uh, something else was created with this wonderful uh, music by Sevda and uh, um, Oriental Wind um, is is can you see connections there in a way I don't know I, uh, when I did this I was on my own voyage in a way oh, okay uh, because it came at the same time that I first returned to the blues and it was just a coincidence because uh, it was hard to get jobs uh, in the 90s as a musician. So we toured with this big ambitious um, orchestra and there was nearly no people attending the concerts. And then I just went out in the town I was in and that I saw they searched for a blues band. So I said, I have a blues band. I didn't have a blues band, but I thought I had. And then I toured with a little three piece blues band doing all these blues songs that, that I knew. And at the same time, uh, the CD record industry released a lot, lot of old uh, music by Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf that was sold on petrol stations. So I bought them. So I dived into this old blue stuff again. Yeah. And then when I was there at these uh, clubs and bars, it was very heavy to play four sets with blues music and people were totally pissed and drunk and fought the whole way. And then even in that situation, I tried to do something different. So I tried to do That's All Right on mandolin and and, and uh, uh, rolling and tumbling on Turkish jumbas. And I noticed that some people really thought that this was nice. Yeah. And I did myself. So that is my voyage. I didn't listen to a lot of other collaborations okay. or what they did. It was just my voyage into the blues music again and with these instruments. So I had a lot of fun because it was actually, a, I wanted to, like That's All Right with Urban Turban. Uh, the song goes, that's all right, mama, that's all right with you. That's all right, mama, hey, any way you do, that's all right. So, And I made a melody that seems like a folk melody, but in a way, it's a part of that. So it goes... No, it goes... It's nearly it's the same melody, but it's not. So the whole thing with Urban Turban was to go into a song, the audience doesn't know, they wonder, two or three minutes into what the hell is this song? Yeah. And then they said, oh, it's Jimi Hendrix, Voodoo Child. Yeah. And then we go off from that again and go, on, go into a Polska and then into Arabia. So they were like cheated all the way through. And they had a good time, I think, yeah. a lot of them. But uh, to begin playing for people that are pissed drunk, that's a hard situation, but it was very educational for me. So the, the, the collaborations with the Arabians, that came after a while, uh, because then I saw at these bars that the Arabian part of the audience really loved this stuff. Oh. It, 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 to me, it sounds uh, like the sort of the, the the perfect sort of um if you if you looked up progressive in the dictionary the, it should be a picture of you um 
because you have done yeah. this incredible Maybe. journey it wow. is is a pro progressive a term that you use and i no, I, I'm, I'm a little bit like i'm fishing here because because when i i called you we we only talked in five minutes but we just mm -hmm. we, we set a date but we managed to just scrape the surface of of talking about john genres mm -hmm. uh, uh, you said that you think that genres is important when it comes to music because yes. we need categories uh, yeah. And I thought that's what was a nice statement. It would be nice to just dwell a little bit on that. Yeah, for me, it's uh, I have to know, uh, and that 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 doesn't mean that I I decide a genre and then that then I'm satisfied. For example, country. Uh, my wife says she hates country, but she loves Neil Neil Young, mm -hmm. and that is so interesting because Neil Young is country. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nearly everything he's done is 60 or 70 percent country. Uh, but so you use genres uh, to identify the music that you don't like. Okay. So you say, I don't like synth music. And then you can, but, but you like Peter Gabriel. He used synths. Yeah. Yeah. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. So actually what they're saying, I don't like synths when they are used in that way and they can point at, at the music where they are used in a bad way. Uh, um, a lot of people then say, okay, then genre is not important, but that's not my opinion. I think they are very important because I actually love when we talk about music and the ideas of music. I don't like when you you use music to to um, to uh, harass people. Uh, so, uh, to to for example, a lot of people talk about music to uh, to make themselves important and say that I just uh, if if someone says I like Beatles. Then they say, oh, no, or it's much more uh, with Pink Floyd. Uh, someone says, I like Pink Floyd. Oh, no, it's only Sid Barrett's Pink Floyd I like. Okay. That's a totally, that's a statement that identifies these power statements okay. that yeah. make people feel bad. Okay, I, I like the wrong Pink Floyd then. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean, mean genres is uh, not important because then you can see that Pink Floyd in the beginning, uh, they are early psychedelia with Sid Barrett. Then they go into a sort of totally their own genre that is a Pink Floyd genre. Yeah. That yes. David Gilmore very much creates on his own with the help of Peter Green, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah, then they really is what uh, a friend of mine said, Pink Floyd is blues with echo. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that is so nice because if you listen to Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, it's actually a slow blues. Oh, okay, yeah. Remember when you were young? That's it's right off. It's a, a blues song, uh, but with a lot of spacey echo. Yeah. So, uh, so when you identify uh, genres and music and say, "What is this genre? What is, what does it?" Uh, uh, first, it's often a rhythm. Twist is not actually a music genre it's a rhythm rhythm yeah but it became uh and also mercy beat is also a rhythm and uh, uh samba is a rhythm mm -hmm. uh but uh, it is interpreted as a genre yeah but that makes it easy because if a song is not a twist rhythm it can't be twist uh, so that's easy, yeah. but it's much uh, harder when you come into like country and and uh, 
And it makes the music so interesting because it was only one year ago I noticed that this um, thing with blues that I know a lot about, uh, nearly 70 or 80 percent of all the blues songs is in major. Okay. So if you take Born Under a Bad Sign, it's a song about being born under this bad sign, but the song goes in major chords. Hmm. What is traditionally said to be a happy yeah. uh, 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 signal, but okay. the melody goes and the solo goes in minor. So it's quite complicated yeah. because then the often in the song, the minor uh, terse and the major terse is played at the same time. Hmm. So it, it, I can explain it with a blues song called Worried Life Blues. Uh, it goes in major, so it's a, a major chords. And then the first phrase is, uh, I don't care where you go. It goes up to the minor third, but the chord behind that is in major third. It's nearly impossible to think, yeah. but that is a totally accepted genre that is, uh, wow, <laughs> like yeah. this. Uh, so to take that away and say, no, that's not important. That's totally uninteresting. It's just the blues and it express feelings. I find that banal and yeah. just yeah. It doesn't mean anything to me. And I have fought my academic life against to uh, interpret music as feeling. Okay. Okay. I, th I think that music is much more than that. Because when you say it's about feelings, actually you want to capture a song or a genre in one feeling. For example, sadness or happiness. Yeah. But the thing with music is it, it's often about a lot of mix of feelings at the same time. So blues can be happy, sad, slow, fast, um, uh, at the same time. Yeah. And it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And that's so strange. Mm -hmm. uh, and we who produce music or makes music, uh, we can do a happy song when we are sad and a sad song when we are happy. It doesn't mean anything to us <laughs> because it's a, a machinery in a way. Um, and the, what people doesn't understand when we play these songs, uh, it really is a machinery going on okay. because... Uh, uh, we don't feel more than the audience. We feel less than the audience. That's think, very hard to take. That yeah. Robert Plant is singing, uh, you need cooling, baby, I need fooling. But he's used a technique. He knows exactly what to do. But he can at the same time think about, well, am I going to eat tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. The, but the people sit there, oh, he's singing to me. He feels so much. Maybe he starts crying now, but no, he's not at all. He's, he's in his very well-known uh, neighborhood, and he very seldom thinks about this as a, a neighbor of feelings. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, so it's a, it's it's is it a part of act? Should you say, or is it? Yes, a, yes, yes. Part uh, of totally. Job? And when you play guitar uh, or an instrument, it's much more that because then you can, uh, like, being uh, you know all these grips. That's only. Uh, some rubbish thing you have learned in. So you try all the time to find these ways to play your, your, your stuff in a different way. <laughs> so you, you try to find a new instrument or, or tune it differently or 
listen to new rhythms only to find a different path. Mm. That doesn't mean that you, you. Um, it was very interesting when I, uh, um, uh, my son was born. I thought that that would disturb me, but it didn't. I was very good at playing with him, talking to him, and at the same time thinking of a song that I wanted to do. So I didn't need to be concentrated. I thought it was good not to be concentrated on, on the song. I needed this. So a lot of times my, my technique for both writing and um, doing music or anything is to leave it. Mm, okay. So uh, do a bit of concentrated work and then very fast I find no, I'm not coming anywhere with this, so I just leave it. And then children is very good for that because they yell at you, uh, you have to come or something. Yeah. And when you return, uh, things have has naturally moved, both in time. It, it was 11 o'clock when I tried last time, now it's three o'clock. Mm. So it, the whole world has changed and my attitude has changed and uh, my body has changed, suddenly it seems in another way, <laughs> uh, so to say. Uh, so uh, I've, I have used that uh, a lot, uh, a lot of technique actually to, to be creative. Um, and I also used all these theater plays and films I made music to, I use them to push me into being, because there you have a sort of very um, uh, needy stuff. They say, we want half an hour of music till Friday. Okay. You can't say that I'm not inspired to do that. No. Then you get, don't get any money. So you have to do the thing. And then you discover that you have this music inside of you. You would just have to drag it out by the ear, and uh, then wow, that <laughs> was very interesting. <laughs> and the thing is that uh, I once had uh, three theater jobs and one film at the same time, and also one radio series where where I had to do um, music to six twenty-minute stuff per week. So you didn't have time to at all value what you did. You could you couldn't say, oh, this is bad, or you just produce, 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 produce. And in the end, after uh, this period, I said, what good stuff I did. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that uh, it could come so much good music from being forced to do it. Yeah, sure. But I mean, 50 years of, of uh, um, being a prof professional musician, uh, I guess, does that. Or 30 years, or whenever you did. Uh, yeah. sort of, I mean, yeah, some, maybe some it is. But, but I think I, I can't judge on people's creativity, uh, only my own. And uh, force is a very good thing for me. If, if I'm uh, tomorrow, I'm going to. Uh, I've invited people to uh, a dinner where I'm going to do a borsch, and so I have to do it yeah. in the best way I can. Uh, if I didn't do it, I, I, then I wouldn't learn to do borsch. So, uh, so it's so good with this. Um, it's so many myths about sitting and waiting for inspiration. And yeah, I have a lot of friends that never, never... They waited for the inspiration to come and the good situation, it never came. So they never made an album or a song or anything. Yeah, that's a, that's a shame. Um, uh, just uh, I, when I showed this, um, no. when I bought this, played it, um, read about it and show this on my channel, I, I claim that this is one of the most important records uh, that mm -hmm. has been released in Sweden uh, the past maybe decade or something like that. 
could you tell us a little bit about the project and why it was so yeah uh, actually uh, first um uh, uh, i have been very interested in fascist movements and when sd the swedish democrats came uh, to be more popular I noticed this guy, Matthias Carlson, who was this, um, he's uh, sort of the ideologic uh, master in Swedish Democrats. And so I, I decided to do an interview with him. And it was so interesting because he's, he was friendly, he was um, interesting, he was... Um, um, yeah, he was devoted. Um, and the things he said was horrifying to me yeah. that he, he wanted like use culture uh, in a way to change the mindset of people uh, to what he believed. And then he mentioned Jan Johansson and the record Jasper Svenska. And to me, that was just like an insult that he he mentioned this, that this was naturally real Swedish music. And of course it wasn't because John Johansson did this jazz record where he changed the Swedish old music into bluesy, jazzy stuff. Okay. Uh, so it was actually a music that he ought to hate, but he didn't understand that. Yeah. So I decided I have to do, uh, I, th I think I was, I just tried out first uh, a Finnish, uh, uh, I have all this uh, old Swedish folk music that my old um, prog bands played, like Arbit of Fritid, I learned all this stuff. Uh, uh, so I tried first uh, Finsk Sari Mark. Uh, from Arbit of Fritid. And I played this on Dobro slide guitar and it's nearly impossible because when you learn Dobro slide, it's tuned in open major chords. Okay. And uh, it's made to play blues on. So, and I decided very early, this is too boring to do. To play this that it was made to do no, not for me. I tried to do a lot of stuff on the Dobro. And then I found this with these minor tuned music that I play on the major tuned uh, slide guitar. That was fun. Yeah. But it was so very hard, so very hard to play fast polska that goes on the slide guitar. Um, so I first learned that for myself, and then I started contacting other musicians. At the same time, the COVID-19 came. So when we decided to do this record, it was impossible to re record in a studio together. So then I tried this with recording at home on my computer, just alone with uh, some rhythms. and then. I phoned other musicians. They were also sitting at home uh, just waiting for something to do. So they said, yes, we really want to do this. So then uh, they recorded at their home and then they sent it to me. So I could just uh, take what I wanted and take away what I didn't want to. And then uh, in the end came this record. So it yeah. was quite uh, both the production the style of it and the music and everything. And uh, in the end, I also uh, did, um, I did like nearly Pink Floydish uh, sound recordings also of me walking on the, uh, on the road here or, or uh, me playing on, on, uh, on uh, uh, urns and things. It was like, uh, very creative to uh, uh, expand the whole thinking of of music. Uh, so yeah, uh, 
I thought it was fun just <laughs> and then I when I when I took in uh, Mukrian uh, Abu Bakr from Kurdistan yeah. who plays beautiful violin and he also arranged a whole piece in uh, the Arabian way and uh, did all the overdubs himself on cello and strings it was uh, amazing and uh, also uh, uh, in the end uh, uh, my Syrian singer Suher Shukar came in and did this wonderful she actually we do uh, emigrant visa that in the original it was a warning song for Swedish immigrants that wanted to go to the United States so the song goes don't do it because it's dangerous and you can be killed yeah. and uh, but it starts off with Suher singing and telling her story in Arabic words. And we just listen to it as beautiful words because it's so seldom that we hear Arabian words that is not affected. We hear it on television and say, everybody loves it like, like that because they've just been killed or something. But now she tells the story in very melodic, beautiful way. We hear this beautiful language, but we can't understand the words. And that is exactly the same situation that she had when she came here. She heard our words yeah, and yeah. it was, she thought it was a beautiful language, but she couldn't understand anything. So it was like the opposite way around. That is why I don't translate what she says. We have to guess that it's about her, her journey here. Uh, and then comes this emigrant visa that is about going to another country. So it's, yeah, it was um, uh, hugely important for me. We did some, some um, a lot of uh, concerts also that was also very successful. Yeah, streamed or was this on the... No, it was uh, after the pandemic had lightened a lot. Uh, so then we, we toured in Sweden. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it's a, a super important uh, record and, and uh, sort of reclaiming uh, Johan music, but uh, music, but also yeah. uh, the, the song Sverige by, by uh, the Swedish bank Kent. Yeah. It's also fantastic. So mm. yeah, um, man, I, I I could talk uh, or or listen to you talk <laughs> for yeah. hours and hours and hours. Uh, but uh, I should tell you a little about the, what I'm doing now. Is yeah, exactly that, exactly. Um, uh, I created from my book, uh, the tale of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Yep. I wanted to play Bo Hansson's music because it has never been performed with a whole live band in an ordinary way. It was just played by two guys, drums and organs or something. So I asked Kenny Håkansson, who was on these early records, and Bill Örström yeah. if they wanted to be, and they wanted. So we have now a band that is very successful. We get uh, concerts all over Sweden and we love to play it because it's so beautiful music so uh, that's a good, good thing for me then I actually I, I had this band that played Peter Green's music and on the concert I just it was a quite a bad concert no one came so I just switched to play organ mm, okay I had my little organ with me and people loved it. I saw the very happy faces on where we, we played Booker T in the MGs. We played um, with a little help from our friends from Woodstock and so forth. And people really loved it. <laughs> so I, uh, I did this thing with uh, taking um, songs from nearly each of my records all the way from Triangulus and up to now. Uh, and uh, transform them into organ music. So I play 
the Frafisa organ and Wurlitzer organ. And the music became totally another thing when it was played on organ. So we have a little uh, band, bass, drums, guitar, and me playing organ. And uh, I, I notice it's seldom that I see people getting so happy from this because the sounds are a bit silly mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, from the Fafisa organ. It sounds a bit quirky. Yeah. And uh, then these sad melodies become so beautiful. So we play, for example, Sirius B from mm -hmm. Triangulus. And we play... From Via, we play both, both Sherpa, we play also Caron, mm. and uh, we play um, uh, later stuff also. And uh, so I have uh, plans on doing a record with it. And, oh, and uh, uh, we, had, we have already recorded, uh, so that's what I'm mixing now. Mm. But then I'm also going out solo tours where I'm lecturing about my books and um, or lecturing. I'm, I'm telling the people, uh, as I do now, yeah. telling about Peter Green book and uh, the book about the unmusical uh, and uh, things. And so it will be very good. Two weeks in December, two weeks in February okay. on my own. Then I'm playing and telling both on schools and, and also on libraries and uh, everything so okay. cool. so i'm i'm very very occupied uh, and uh, uh, we are do this ragnarök 50 years anniversary now in two weeks uh, but after that i'm very very doubtful that will there will be any continuing from that okay uh, we have done some beautiful music but i think it it's good to end here Sure. I saw. I saw that uh, there. You could uh, pre-book the the fiftieth anniversary on Silence mm. uh, the, the the web page. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, there's uh, uh, on Ragnarok's web page. There's a uh, live from Japan in two thousand. Yeah. Stuff like yeah, that yeah. on CD that you can buy. Um. So so yeah. Uh, I don't think I have anything. No. <laughs> Uh, I, I, this has been, yeah, so inspiring and that one was uh, interesting to, because it's very seldom I, I get to. They want to talk to me about one thing or one thing or one thing, and often they call me from the radio and just to, can you tell us a bit about? And then it's maybe just one part of a book or one yeah. part of a. a uh, to uh, be able to talk of a whole career is very seldom. Okay, yeah, I, I think that that because when I talk to to Janne Schaffer and Dennis Lixen and and uh, those uh, Mats Gustafsson, um, I, I think that uh, we I have like it's very relaxed on uh, this and this sort of doing these conversations on zoom is also very relaxed on in a way so yeah. there's no um what's it's called in in english um prestige prestige no. <laughs> in, the, in the conversation if you get mm. what i mean so right. uh, yeah I, I i believe that it's easy for me to say that i have a great time but it feels like the persons that i talk with also thinks it, it's a good nice conversation so yeah Thank you so so much for the for your time you. and and the, the stories and uh, we'll catch you on on uh, tour and on the on the uh, lectures and and uh, yeah. the music that you release. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing if you haven't for more content like this and give it a thumbs up just to to show some appreciation. See you in my next video. Bye.